This is a big, round, tremendous artifact. I'd say 40, 80 tons. I'd like to see. Here, there's my shadow, Johnny Oliverio. That's me. Let me see if I can wave to everybody and give you a big wave. Wait a minute, folks. Hey, it's the shadow people. Oh my god, they're here. Lost civilization, folks. Right here in Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia, the so-called city on the seven hills, epicenter of history, both past and present. How far back does the history go? The first English-speaking people arrived here in 1608, the first Homo sapiens 15,000 years ago, and one leading archaeologist, Dr. Dennis Stanford of the Smithsonian Institute, says we may have been here even before that. Is there any debate today in the archaeological community about the Bering Land Bridge theory? No debate. The Bering Land Bridge theory is so at this point. Uh, so where does that leave the Soul Train hypothesis? Soul Train hypothesis is unrelated to the Bering Land theory. The, the Soul Train hypothesis was a theory that early Homo sapiens moved from Africa to Asia to the Americas, following a uh, ecosystem based around bull kelp, and this has been supported, um, actually fairly supported a bit in the archaeological community, including by Dr. Stanford of the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, and how would these ancient humans follow the bull kelp? I mean, the bull kelp goes from France so to modern-day Virginia. They would, right, right. They, they would follow this um, ecosystem of bull kelp using uh, walrus and uh, whalebone canoes, um, and they'd use the uh, pieces of the walrus, including the flesh and the bones, to Dr. Stanford never found concrete evidence for the Soul Train hypothesis. But one Virginia man, a real estate broker named John Gabriel, says it's been right in front of us the whole time. This one here is square and I saw it from the river in 1965 with a group of teenagers and everyone kind of made fun of me at that time because they said, what do you think, someone carved that thing? And I said, well, it could have been because why are the rest of the rocks around? And that's when that same year, 1965, we just brought out hundreds and hundreds of what we looked like different type of rocks we didn't know what they were but we were kind of figuring if there were people that were carving things maybe it was weapons art or tools things that they survived with but it took uh, sometimes it takes a long time to figure it out
Now what is this? I don't know. Might just be a rock. Sure looks like a rib cage, doesn't it? It does. Oh. What's on the back? Sometimes when you find something like this, you look places to hold it. But I think that this is probably just a rock. Over the years, Gabriel has found all kinds of formations, including frogs, seals, various shapes, and what appears to be a foot of a Neanderthal. Once he found an anatomically accurate human heart, but he gave it to an old girlfriend long ago. In 1985, Gabriel took his impressive collection to the Smithsonian for verification, but when he met with an archaeologist, he received a surprising response. Later I had an appointment with the archaeologist and he brings me over to his desk, he looked at everything, and he said, uh, show me a couple arrowheads, and he said, see, I made these too. And I said, I didn't make this, I didn't carve these artifacts. And it was a real disappointing appointment because the archaeologist that I had a meeting with tells me, accuses me of making these artifacts, weapons, art, and tools, and once he did, I was disappointed for the rest of the day until my eight-year-old niece, uh, Erica Joy Oliverio, eight years old, said, Uncle John, he did teach you something. And I said, no, and he wouldn't teach me any history. And she said, yes, if he accused you of making them, then you know some man did. And I thought, here it is, this eight-year-old girl just made my day that now I know, I just didn't think of it, that these were made by man, because I know I didn't make them. In 2011, Gabriel found his first 100-ton sculpture. I was out in the river one day, and you have to remember, keep in perspective, that for 30 years I was showing people um, weapons, art and tools, artifacts out of stone, and people were making fun of me. That's just a rock. And they thought it was a, really a waste of my time. And I had gone down the main rapid at the pony pasture, and I got a little tired, and I decided instead of continuing down the river, snorkeling and looking for things, that I would uh, head up the river a little while. So I got out of the rapid, I stood up, and as I was facing up the river, I could see the walrus. I could see the nose of the walrus. And once I saw it, my whole body just kind of, it was like, all the people that made fun of me all that time, that you know they couldn't accuse you of carving this. And it also seemed like I could hear a cheer of people who at the same time were cheering me that I found it. You finally found it, you dumb son of a bitches. Look how big we made these sculptures and you finally saw it. <laughs> and I was thinking, I, I, I was so happy that I saw them, but I could hear them making fun of me. And I'm going, man, I did it. I really did it, but I couldn't have done it. I could have never seen the sculptures if it wasn't for Dr. Dennis Stanford. The discovery of the walrus, 46 years into his journey, would spark a new wave of adventuring for Gabriel. probably the most uh, exciting time in the discovery is when I realized that there probably are a lot more. And after that day of seeing the walrus, 
Then I start searching for the hundred ton sculptures up down the walrus, the whale, the sea turtle, uh, the hop, the frog, the tadpole. All these are hundred tons. Down at the Texas beach, there's a tremendous uh, called, uh, snapping turtle. Tremendous snapping turtle. And it, it uh, has never ended. It's always been a day, every day, to wake up to know there's a lost civilization there. It's the most wonderful feeling you can have. So what are we looking at here? This is uh, a hawk, and it's probably a couple hundred tons. Here's the tip of the bird's beak. Here's, it's a cooper hawk. And a cooper hawk has a ring, and its uh, feathers are shaped just like this right here. Uh, and you can see its wing right here. Um, I thought, again, it was the cardinal bird, Richard Mackey, Dick Mackey, Big Mac, a friend of mine came down here and said, he studied hawks, he said, this shoulder here, he said, this shoulder is her wings, and when she gets in her nest, her wings look like shoulders, and this is not a cardinal, this is a hawk. And he said, look on the other side, he said, there's a, uh, a shoulder on the other side, she has two shoulders. Her head's to the left, she's like she's in her nest. Here's the ring, and the ring is this big. If you can see it, at first I didn't think the left side you could see it. And this ring is symmetrical all the way across the back. This is a Cooper hop. The age again is this water hole because there was no water here. There's a very little river. The ice was still melting 60,000 years ago. We study Dr. Ben Stafford's ice age map on YouTube. Yeah, we were down here just getting some sun and uh, planning on doing a little fishing and showing me around a little bit. And uh, he was telling me about the, uh, the frog and a few other things. And then the uh, following month, we went up to uh, Pony Pasture, saw some more stuff up there like a hawk or he thought it was a cardinal and I said that's a perfect outline of a hawk so we had difference of opinion on that item but uh, had um, quite a few other uh, pieces to look at at pony pasture as well and then the, the third time down here is when I saw the eagle because I was accustomed to looking for shapes that I recognized and uh, saw the eagle and then we spent the rest of the day looking for the head in the water which was a lot of fun but uh, never quite found anything that would pass in our mind for the head. Gabriel's findings have never been ratified by archaeologists but what would Dr. Dennis Stanford think? I studied him and studied him, and that's all he continued to say was walrus whale. That kept going through my mind. Walrus whale. They could have made it here using canoes made from the bones and the hides of walruses and whales. They could have fed off of them. Dr. Stanford. This is his lost civilization. I was just a good student who studied him. This is Dr. Dennis Stanford's lost civilization. And... Dr. Stanford just passed a few months ago. I called him to irritate him. I used to say I'm irritating him. Um, and it's the funniest thing. The first email I ever sent to him, I, I called archaeologists lazy fat asses. That's all you do is sit on your asses and not ever get out of those museums. And oh man, I must have got him upset because he sent me this email back and told me I should have more respect. So then I apologized, and we had this little uh, emailing back and forth, and I know he studied man, so I said, why don't you study the man at the NASCAR track? Why don't you come on to the race with me? We'll do a race on Saturday, then I'll show you my lost civilization on Sunday. And he couldn't, uh, he always had a busy schedule. And he was always in one part of the country and the other part of the country or the world, and he was... Uh, 
he's the person I studied that allowed me to see the walrus. But even though Gabriel never met Dr. Stanford, he says at Belle Isle, he has an ace in the hole, a carving to silence even his most ardent critics. On Mother's Day in 2011, I believe, I was with my girlfriend, Luda Jones. Luda Jones had discovered the horse's head at the time. That's the only thing we thought it was, was the horse's head. We'd gone down to one area of the cliffs and I asked her, I said, honey, can I look at the cliffs? Because if I'm finding that many sculptures up at the pony pasture, there might be art carvings on these cliffs. So we went to the first cliff and we didn't see anything. So we went on down by the um, quarry and the climbing wall, and that's when she said, I see what you're talking about, it's a horse's head. It took me 20 minutes to see it, but uh, it was Mother's Day, so we named uh, that particular art sculpture after her mom and my mom, Edith Catherine. The next year, 2012, I went down, took a picture of the entire cliff, uh, then I enlarged it. When I enlarged it, I continued to look at it in my room at night, and then I noticed there was a chest, there was two feet, I saw the wings, because at one time I thought it was a porpoise, a horse, and a turkey. Then when I saw the two feet, the hoof and the thigh, it didn't take me long to see the back wings. And many times when I'm showing the Pegasus at Bell's Isle, people say to a certain wing, will say, look, that wing looks like a butterfly wing. And I always joke and say, well, you know, it could have been a hummingbird wing. And if she had a hundred of these, she could have gone left, gone right, and boom, she could have kicked you right in your face. Susie, get out the street. Remember your brother Jimmy got kicked by the Pegasus? I mean, you never know back in those days, but who would carve a Pegasus and right above the hoof and the thigh, right in the same direction the horse's head is facing, you have a baby horse in a marsupial pouch. Um, it took some time to see the Neanderthal, uh, three people, a young couple between 24 and 34, two of them had seen what they said, do you see the man? Then a 12 year old said the same thing. When I realized that three people were seeing a man I did not see, it took me a while to see it. But when I did, I got excited almost as I did with the walrus. It was a great piece of the puzzle because this Neanderthal had a shoulder this big and uh, the neatest thing is the anatomy of how they carved and painted that shoulder. They used, first people says that they used black, uh, orange, and white okra to paint. Well, the shoulder is just, the anatomy is just, just gorgeous. And then the mouth, it looks like an upside down C, but that mouth is about as big as a camel's lips would be, and that's how they melted ice. When Dr. Dennis Stanford said they had to constantly melt ice, well, Neanderthal has these huge, tremendous camel lips. He evolved these camel lips to be able to survive by melting ice. And there's a huge chunk of skin above his eye, which would also uh, have a muscle in it to be able to come down and cover the eye during whiteouts. That Neanderthal is a piece of the puzzle that's wonderful. I thought Homo sapiens killed the Neanderthal off. We never killed off the Neanderthal. He was not an ape, he was a human. And this fact kind of attributes to underestimating women. Women are the reason we did not kill off the Neanderthal. Her children were going to survive. She'd have a baby with the strong guy, she'd have a baby with the little guy, he could get through the hole. It was all about survival to a woman. Because of their intelligence, because of women's intuitions, they made sure that before they moved their family, they knew every plant, every water hole, um, and every food source. Neanderthal was not an ape. Early, when we first came out 200,000 years ago, Neanderthal were teaching us once women learned that Neanderthal could cure their sister's son with a plant, he became our fathers and our grandfathers. We mated them out. We never killed them off. Neanderthal uh, was part of the family as Homo sapiens out of Africa, 
migrated to Europe, it took them approximately 140,000 years. But as women continue to take the best out of every human on earth, because there are many life forms on earth at that time, but women's intuitions and intelligence were underestimated by archaeologists. They uh, did not kill off the Neanderthal. And for a hundred years, they taught us wrong. They said we killed them off, that they were apes. And that was not true. Did Dr. Dennis Sanford claim that Neanderthals were here in Virginia? Uh, Dr. Stanford studied Homo sapiens, not Homo neanderthalis. Um, and uh, Neanderthals were have to have died out around 60,000 years ago. And Dr. Stanford placed humans, as we know them today, Homo sapiens, here only 20,000 years ago. But it is true that in year 2000, studies were done that proved that Neanderthals were not killed out as previously thought, but rather made it out? Yes, that's true. After DNA tests were performed on the Neanderthal skull, the scientists called the archaeologists and said, boys, we have a problem. We are the Neanderthal, we never killed them off. Estimating that we have approximately one to three percent Neanderthal DNA in every one of us. And for some of you guys who occasionally get hell from your wives and girlfriends, just let them know, honey, maybe I have six to seven percent Neanderthal and maybe that will explain everything. <laughs> These days, Gabriel spends much of his time educating fortunate passerby on the real history of the James River. Were you skeptical at all when he first told you about it before you saw them for yourself? Oh, sure, sure. That, I think it's natural. But I've been in nature my whole life and saw things that most people don't see. Like, uh, you know, you can see shapes in trees and roots and stuff. And when you're sitting on a deer stand, like I did for many years, and, uh, you can, your mind wanders. And it's, if your mind is open, you can see these things. So I was skeptical about certain things, but uh, I, let, I let him explain his process of how he sees things. And I think he's visually, he's probably a lot more adept at it than I was at the time. And during my presentations, I have a couple little signs up and um, it state that you can see a 50,000 year old lost civilization, uh, see the horse's head, I have another sign. And I don't even want to put down and see the Pegasus because I don't want to scare people off. But during my presentations, I'll have people stop and say different things. Well, I like for people to, to listen to the presentation and ask questions if they want. But sometimes I have people like this one guy who rides up quickly on the bicycle. And this guy's between 30 and 40. This isn't any 12-year-old. Uh, and he'll yell out in front of everybody as I'm giving my presentation, says that horse can't be 60,000 years old because horses came here in the 1500s. Well, I know that. I know when horses came, but if he would stick around and just look, it's not your typical horse. This horse has wings in the front, wings in the back. She's snorting like a female bear and deer in the woods when they have their little babies because in a marsupial pouch, she has a baby horse also. And uh, this guy will yell out in front of everyone during my presentation, and then he takes off like a little kid. And I don't say anything because, uh, you know, everyone knows the horse came here in the 1500s, but what's carved down at Bell Isle, a female pegasus with a marsupial pouch, she's snorting just like a female bear and deer in the woods to smell predators. 
and her wings are all out. She's the one of the most beautiful sculptures in the whole world, right in Richmond, Virginia. You gotta come to see it, you're gonna love it. And when you see it, you're gonna yell out just like everyone else yells out, I see it, I see it, and they do see it.